This is 80 calc, 5.4, day number one. Goal for the day is to evaluate a definite integral by using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I'm going to tag this with part one. This video will be focused on FTC part one. Our next video will be on FTC part two. So let's evaluate the following definite integrals using geometric methods and see if we can get an exact value for the definite integral itself. Let's call this t, let's call this f of t. Of course, we're working with a definite integral with bounds of 0 to 3. So I'm going to put that on the independent axis of t. So here's t equals 0. Let's say this is t equals 3. Well, our function f of t is a constant of 60. So f of t equals 60. And what we're seeking here is this area. Now that area geometrically is pretty simple to find. We'd take base times height, which would be 3 times 60. And of course, we'd get 180. Now we can be 100% confident in that answer, as of course, this is a rectangle. Let's look at part B. Let's take 2t from 1 to 3. Okay, so 2t from 1 to 3. All right, so here's t equals 1. Here's t equals 3. 2t from 1 to 3. Well, I'm going to go up here to 6. Okay, we'll call this our f of t axis. And the reason I put a 6 there is because I know that the function 2t equals 2t, right, the output of y of 3 would be 6, right? and then the output of y of 1 would be 2. Okay, so I'm seeking yet again an area beneath the curve, trapped between the x-axis and the curve, as well as between the two bounds, t equals 1 and t equals 3, so I'm looking for the area of that trapezoid. So I'm going to identify these two lengths as bases and the distance between the bases as the height with regards to the trapezoid area. And therefore, the height would be 2, the two bases would be 2 and 6, and I can find that area. Of course, we know the area formula for a trapezoid would be 1 half the sum of the two bases, 2 and 6, times the height, which of course is also 2. Simplifying this answer, we would come out to get half of 8, which is 4, times 2, which is 8. All right, so the area underneath uh, the curve, or in this case the line 2t from 1 to 3, would be 8. All right, let's continue with part C. Now, part C is unique. Actually, using these methods, we won't be able to calculate this area, at least with 100% accuracy due to the fact that this curve is not linear in any way, shape, or form. So we would have to, in this case, utilize either a uh, rectangular approximation method, whether it be an R-RAM, L-RAM, trapezoid, or midpoint. Uh, but I could graph t squared plus 3. Here's uh, y equals 3. And then, of course, t squared plus 3 would look something like this. So if I went from t equals 0, out to t equals 3. Uh, f at 0 is 3, so this would be the point 0, 3. And then f at 3 would be 12. Clearly not to scale, but I would have a 12 here, and this point would be the point 3, 12. Okay, so we can see that the area trapped between the bounds t equals 0, t equals 3, and between the function t squared plus 3, which I would call f of t in this case, f of t, t squared plus 3, and the x-axis, or in this case the t-axis. Of course, we could not uh, calculate that area with 100% accuracy using just geometric methods. Right? We'd have to use some kind of rectangular approximation, again, or a trapezoid or something like that. So let's look down at these notes here. We can notice on parts A and B, we can use geometry, right? Just trapezoid, and rectangle, potentially a triangle in some situations, but C fails in this. So looking back at the previous lessons, 
we made a uh, relationship between this rectangular approximation method and the net area, right, or the integral uh, with the notation from a to b of f of x dx. So recall that delta x was b minus a, right, and f of x sub i, or what we called f of a plus i delta x, right, ended up being the heights. So you can see as we take the limit as n goes to infinity of all of these rectangles, these n rectangles, it's going to approach the exact area underneath the curve. Okay, so we're going to look at what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus on the next page and talk and dive into the mechanics of using it in further uh, examples. All right, let's get to that. All right, the fundamental theorem of calculus formally makes the connection to the antiderivative. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, FTC, let's note that yet again, get used to that, says the following, right? This Riemann method over here is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x, which comes out to be big F, which is the antiderivative of f, little f, evaluated from a to b. So that means we're going to take f of b, big F of b, minus big F of a. You'll notice that we no longer have that constant of integration at all involved. When you use the fundamental theorem and you have what's called a definite integral from a to b, you no longer have to use that constant of integration. So we're going to use this. Right? We're going to find the antiderivative. Take f, big F at the upper limit of the antiderivative minus big F at the lower limit of the antiderivative. Of course, where big F of x is any antiderivative of f of x. So in other words, the derivative of big F should be equal to little f. All right, so let's get into a couple of examples here. To find the value of a definite integral, all we have to do is find the antiderivative and evaluate the derivative at antiderivative, excuse me, at b and a, and then find their difference. This is a number. And what this number will represent is the area trapped beneath the curve or between the curve and the x-axis on the interval given. So let's do a little work here with the antiderivative or the integral. From 1 to 3 of x squared, and then we'll look at it geometrically. And we'll also check with our calculator. I'll show you some syntax for that. Okay, the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. Typically, leading up to what we're doing right now, we're used to working with that constant plus c, but in this case, we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus due to the fact that we have a definite integral from a, which is 1, to b, which is 3. So what we're going to take, and we're going to evaluate this antiderivative from 1 to 3. And let's lay out the arithmetic here. That would be 3 to the third over 3, which is big F at 3, minus 1 to the third over 3, which is big F at 1. Notice how that matches what we have above. You can see big F at B minus big F at A. All right, let's complete our algebra here. I'll just kind of note this as a, as a side little set of information. Okay, so 3 cubed is 27 over 3 is 9. 9 minus 1 third. Okay, so that's going to be equivalent to the integral from 1 to 3 of x squared dx is going to be equal to 26 thirds. What does that mean? That means that if I graph x squared from 1 to 3 Okay, so this is, uh, well, I guess we're independent variable of x. There's x equals 0. Here's y equals x squared. Let's go from x equals 1 to x equals 3. Might have made this a little bit too small. The area under the curve, between the curve and the x-axis from 1 to 3, 
ends up equaling 26 thirds. We've got an exact value for that area. All right, let's look at another example. Example two. Okay, two sine t, the area under the curve of two sine t from pi over six to pi over two. Let's just sketch the graph quick. Take a look at what we're dealing with. So here's our t-axis, here's f of t, 2 sine t. Let's go uh, from 0 to pi. Okay, so from 0 out here to t equals pi. Well, this is going to be uh, what we could consider the upper half, right? The upper half of the uh, circle with a radius of 2. So we're going to... We're going to have a max value of 2, and that'll be at pi over 2. Okay, and the function itself is going to look kind of like this. Now it'll continue right, in both directions, but all I'm really concerned about is the area from pi over 6 over to pi over 2. Okay, so I'm concerned about this area right here and this area only. So we're going to find that area by using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's go ahead and do it. So in the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 2, well, I'm going to pull the 2 out. I write this as 2 times the integral from pi over 6 to pi over 2 of sine of t dt. That'll be 2 times negative cosine of t evaluated from pi over 6 to pi over 2. Now, many students will get confused and they'll just put a positive cosine of t. Now, that's due to the fact that you got to get used to thinking backwards with regards to antiderivatives and derivatives. So, the derivative with respect to t of 2 cosine of t that's going to equal negative 2 sine of t. And since that negative does not match the original uh, integrand, this, this thing here, 2 sine t, is called the integrand. Okay, what we're going to do is we're just going to switch the sign, which will give us what we're looking for. Okay, so now we're going to work with that antiderivative, negative 2 cosine of t, evaluating it at pi over 2 and pi over 6. So this will be negative 2 cosine of pi over 2. That's big F at uh, pi over 2 minus a negative 2 cosine at pi over 6. That would be minus big F at pi over 6. Do some evaluating. You can pause the video at any time attempt this process on your own. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so our first term will be 0. Cosine of pi over 6 is uh, root 3 over 2, so it would be negative 2 times root 3 over 2. And thus, we will get an area of positive root 3. That should be the area of this space trapped beneath the curve, the x-axis, and uh, the bounds pi over 6 to pi over 2. All right, let's continue with a few more examples. Okay, as usual, on most of these examples, I'd encourage you to uh, pause the video, work through them, and then continue uh, by watching me work through it. Check your work along the way. Uh, okay, so I'm going to just continue with uh, very similar work patterns as I've been doing on the previous problems. I might cut some corners with regards to how much I describe what I'm doing. And I'm going to use the fundamental theorem, of course, in this case, uh, due to the uh, definite integral that I've been given. Okay, so i got to find an antiderivative. That'd be x to the fourth over 4 uh, plus x. That's the antiderivative of 1. I'm going to evaluate that again from negative 1 to a positive 3. So big F at 3 will be 3 to the fourth over 4 plus 3 minus uh, negative 1 to the 4th over 4. That'll be plus a negative 1. 
right, so really the extent of this problem is just can you work your algebra all the way through. So 3 to the 4th is 81, so that would be 81 fourths plus 9 fourths minus, this will be uh, 1 fourth minus 4 fourths. So we're going to get a, uh, a nice answer. We've got a common denominator already. Let's call this 90 fourths. 90 fourths minus that would be a negative three fourths, uh, which of course comes out to be ninety three fourths. Okay, uh, pretty good there. So the integral from negative one to three of x cubed plus one dx comes out to be uh, ninety three fourths. Oops, in the wrong mode. Here we go. 93 fourths, or you could call that 23 and a quarter. Okay, let's talk about total area. All right, how to find the total area analytically. Okay, so in this problem, we're going to be discussing total area. So we got to know the difference between what's called total area and net area. Okay, so total area. versus net area. Which when we come to it later will be the difference between total distance and displacement. So net area is going to be uh, related to displacement. Okay, so keep those in mind as we talk about this. Okay, so let's take a curve. I'm just going to make it up. And I'm going to say this curve, let's say f of t, uh, looks something like this, okay? So let's take the area from A to B, all right? And let's say that this area trapped between A and, I don't know, let's call this uh, T equals one, so T equals A and T equals B. So I've got these two uh, areas, right? I got this, this area above the T axis, and let's, let's just say that that's got an area of 12 units, 12 square units, and then this area below the t-axis from 1 to b. Let's say that that area is, is 5 square units. Now, as we know, uh, this green area would be considered an area of negative magnitude or negative value. So the total area, in order to find the total area from a to b of f of t, we would actually use the absolute value. We would find the absolute value, and in doing so, we would get an area from A to 1 of 12 units, and an, a value or an area from 1 to B of 5 units. Okay, so within the idea or the concept of total area, we're dealing with the absolute value or, right, any, any area that we get, we're going to negate or change the sign of that area. So I would consider it then positive, which would be positive 5 thus giving me a total area of 17 units squared. Okay, now displacement or net area is going to be slightly different. We don't need any absolute value notation. So to go from A to B, I don't have to change anything. And of course, geometrically, I can clearly see that I have a 12, oops, a 12, that's a 2, and a negative 5, which would give me a net area or as we'll see application-wise, a displacement uh, of seven square units or a displacement may come in, you know, meters or some distance or some, you know, grams or some unit of measure. Okay, so what did I do, right? What I ultimately did was in order to find the total area from A to B of F of T, right, is what I did is I found where F of T equaled zero. And that was kind of a joint or a, or a value in between A and B such that I can find a positive area and a negative area, or maybe two positive areas, I don't know. So really, ultimately, what I did was I, I split this integral up into an integral from a to the first 0 of f of t. Right? We knew f of 1 equaled 0 okay, of the absolute value of f of t. Was the absolute value necessary on the interval from a to 1? No. But does it really matter? No, it doesn't, right? So 
Now, I was able to do that calculation geometrically, and I'm gonna show you how to do this geometrically as well as out analytically in just a moment with an example. So I did need to utilize, right? I did need to utilize the absolute value from one to B due to the fact that this area was negative. So I didn't need the absolute values on this first interval due to the fact that it was positive. Okay, so what does that mean for us in the example that's given? All right, let's look at this uh, in a systematic approach, uh, finding the total area analytically. Okay, so I think we can agree that what I would do is I would be uh, observing and looking for the integral or the area beneath the curve or between the curve and the x-axis from 0 to 3 of this function, 1 minus x squared. Now, without graphing it out, what I could do is I could set 1 minus x squared equal to 0. And this would potentially find me a value where the areas accumulated might go from positive areas to negative areas or negative to positive. So what I know is that this is true when x equals plus or minus 1. Now, only positive 1 falls in this interval. Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus x squared. And I'm going to add it to the integral from 1 to 3 of 1 minus x squared. And if either of those two areas comes out to be negative, I'll just take the absolute value of that area. Okay, so let's look at that individually. Okay, and then we'll look at it graphically. So the integral of 1 minus x squared is x minus x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 1. Plus, we're going to then evaluate the same antiderivative, x minus x cubed over 3 from 1 to 3. We're going to evaluate these individually. Right, so let's, let's highlight this with respect to some, some colors so we know what we're coming out with here. Okay, so if I evaluate that at 1, that would be 1 minus uh, 1 third, which would be 2 thirds. Okay, minus 0 minus 0 thirds, which would be 0. Okay, so this, this is kind of like working with, as we've talked about earlier, big F evaluated at 1 minus big F evaluated at 0. So clearly that'll be a positive area, right? Positive 2 thirds. Now for the other evaluation process, what we would have is if I plugged in a 3, I'd have 3 minus 3 cubed over 3, which is uh, 3 minus 9, which will be a negative 6, minus 1 minus 1 third, which is, of course, 2 thirds. So clearly I'm going to end up, uh, when I do evaluate this and simplify, I'm going to end up taking the absolute value of this. Okay, so because that would be a negative area. All right, so this ends up being 2 thirds plus, then I take the absolute value of whatever my, uh, whatever this evaluates out to. Well, negative 6 is negative 18 thirds, and that'll be minus a 2 thirds. So that'll be uh, negative 20, oops, now you know where I am, negative 20 thirds, which comes out course when we take the absolute value to be positive 20 thirds. So I get 22 thirds. So that would be the total area. Now a couple things. If a question ever asks for the area of the region between that curve and that axis on that interval, you can make the assumption, assume total area. Okay, assume total area unless asked specifically for net. If they ask for net area, then things become a little bit simpler. So let's talk real quick about how to use the calculator. Okay, this notation right here is kind of an older notation that you'll see on uh, TI-83s and, and such, okay? I'll talk about the notation in a moment. This notation over here is a little bit more current. This is like their TI-84 and so on. Now, in order to numerically find uh, the area between two curves, right, there's two different things. If I wanted net area, course I want this right a to b f of t dt pretty simple if I want total area which can be referred to just as the area between two curves or the area between a, a function and a, the x-axis or t-axis what I need to do is I need to know a little bit of notation with regards to the absolute value okay so you need to play around with your calculator a little bit but I'm going to show you using your calculator in this special math 9 option so press the math button and then nine, 
And what that'll do is, depending on your uh, model, your calculator model, it'll come up with this notation. This is the numerical integral of whatever your function is, whatever your independent variable is, and then your lower and upper limits for your integral. In the newer model calculators, when you pass, press Math 9, each of these items comes up as, as a, uh, how shall I say, as a kind of a little fill in the blank. Now the absolute value bars won't be there either, so you have to, uh, you have to get those from your, um, from your catalog, right? So press your math button and toggle over, um, I believe, to the second option. I don't have my calculator with me right now, but you'll toggle over it and you'll see abs, okay? So the absolute values uh, bars themselves can be found using what's called the abs option. So I'll get some gains there. Okay, so you'll have to fill in what your value for a and b are, what your function f of x is, which I would just plug into y1. Okay, plug that into y1, and then uh, the, the dx will show up, but you'll have to fill in the x portion. Okay, over here in the old TI-83 version, uh, you're going to want your function first, and you should have absolute values around that. That is if we're looking for the total area. Okay, and then your independent variable, your lower limit, and your upper limit. So that's a little crash course on how to use your calculator. We'll do a lot more with that in class. All right, let's continue on. All right, we're gonna work some homework problems. So I'm just gonna breeze right through these and work at them at a, a good pace. So I'm gonna talk, maybe make some jokes. I don't even know, but I'm gonna do some integration using fundamental theorem of calculus. I see it, it's a definite integral. Just see it, it's right there, let's go. All right, so I'm going to get, uh, let's look here. This would be x to the fourth minus, how about a 3x squared? Let's see, derivative of 4x to the fourth is 4x cubed. Derivative of negative 3x squared is negative 6x, works for me. Evaluate from 1 to 2 using good notation, not really poor, ugly notation. So I'm going to take big F at 2. That'll be 2 to the fourth, which is 16, minus... 3 times 2 to the second, which will be 12, minus big F at 1, which will be 1, minus, how about a 3? So this will be equal to 4 minus, how about a negative 2? Comes out to be, looks like 6 to me. Good stuff, FTC part 1. Let's continue. Got a calculator allowed question here. Wonder if I'll need it. Graph of F is shown in the figure above, integral from... 1 to 3 of f of x is 2.3. Big F prime is equal to f of x. Then f of, big F of 3 minus big F of 0 is what? Okay, so let's look at 1 to 3. What does that mean? Well, this means the area between f of x and the curve, excuse me, uh, the curve and the x-axis. So let's highlight this area. 1 to 3. It's going to be 2.3. Cool. All right. I got that. I can label this. All right. So what is big F of 3 minus big F of 0 imply? Well, that implies I'm taking the integral from 0 to 3 of little f. All right. And that's given to me in this statement right here. All right, so if big F prime of X is equal to F of X, then the integral of F of X is equal to big F. That tells me right there the relationship. Okay, so if I want big F of three minus big F of zero, I want the area from zero to three under F of X trapped between that and the X axis. So all I need to do is I need to find this area right here, which is a rectangle. That area will be 2. And of course now that tells me that this will equal 4.3. Didn't need a calculator for that one. Just a little bit of common sense and some, some skills in understanding FTC. All right, let's continue to the next slide. Okay, number 3, 1998, no calc. Uh, let me rewrite this definite integral in a different form. This may help some of you. Okay, I rewrite this in what looks like a power function. It's not a power function, but it looks like one. 
helps me to integrate. So this integral will equal x to the negative 1 over negative 1. Notice what I did is I took this power, I added 1, and I divided by that same value. Now I'm going to evaluate that from 1 to 2. Now I'm going to rearrange this just slightly, call this negative 1 over x, and evaluate that from 1 to 2. What will that equal? Well, big F at 2 will equal negative 1 half. Big F at 1 will equal negative 1 over 1. So that will equal negative 1 half plus 1, which comes out to be positive 1 half. All right, all right. Let's look at a calculator allowed question here. It says, let big F be an antiderivative of this thing. Oof. Okay, that's pretty nasty. I could call this f of x. I'm likely going to put this in as y1 in my calculator. Okay, I'm going to write that out. It says is if big F at 1 is equal to 0, then what is big F at 9? Okay, so let's talk about this just in a in a written out non-calculator form. Okay. If I know the integral from, uh, let's go 1 to 9 of f of x, I'm just seeking that. Wouldn't that, by definition, given that big F is an antiderivative of f, wouldn't that, by definition, give me this using the fundamental theorem? The answer to that is yes. Well, I'm big, given big F at 1, it's going to be 0. So I need to find big F at 9. This just becomes an equation, right? And this becomes a simple algebraic equation. It's going to be one step. So notice, if I use my calculator for this piece, right? I do a math 9, and in for y1, I've got that ugly thing right here. So ln of x cubed, you should be typing this into your calculator as we speak. Right? And I do a little math 9 work on that, which tells me, you know, I have to take the antiderivative from 1 to 9 of f of x or y1 with respect to x. I'm going to get a number. Right? I'm going to get a value. That value is equal to big F at 9 minus 0 over big F at 1. So use your calculator, take a break here for a moment, and determine that green number, right? What is the area under that curve from 1 to 9? Okay, so uh, my calculations gave me, what did they give me? Let's see here. I got a 5.827. Uh, is equal to f of 9, big F of 9 minus 0. Well, clearly, that will mean that big F of 9 is equal to 5.827. Now, one thing I didn't mention is that whenever you do any sort of calculations, uh, make sure that you're in radian mode, okay? Make sure you're in radian at all times. If you're in physics, make sure that you're checking that almost uh, with a kind of a sense of paranoia because I know that you guys work in degree mode often. Okay, let's do a couple more questions. All right, interesting question here from the exam in 03. Uh, it gives us the graph of f prime above the derivative of f is the line shown in the figure above. If f at 0 is 5, then what is f at 1? Now, you could do a whole lot of labor here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to keep this simple and look at the relationship, right? The integral from 0 to 1 of f prime of x dx should equal uh, little f, right, at 1 minus little f at 0. Okay, so I know little f at 0 is 5, but I don't know little f at 1. And I don't need to yet, because I'm going to find it. Now, what does this right here represent for us? 
Well, this is simply the area under the curve of f prime, trapped between the x-axis and the curve from 0 to 1. Of course, I can use the area of a triangle in order to find that. So geometrically, I can take 1 half times the base, which in this case is 1, times the height, which is 6. And thus, the area here should be 3. So 3 should equal f of 1 minus f of 5, which of course means that f of 1 must be 8. Very interesting. Now, you can go about that in a much different way and spend a lot more time and effort. But using the fundamental theorem, that is the quickest way to get there. Okay, non-calculator 08, particle motion, all that stuff. Let's do it. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, where we were at in section 5.1 and where we're at now. So what would we have done in section 5.1? Well, what we would have done is, is find the antiderivative of V of T. All right, so let's read the problem and then talk about this. Particle moves along the x-axis with velocity given for T greater than or equal to 0. If the particle has a position of 2 at time 0, then x of 2, oops, x of 0, excuse me, is equal to 2. That's going to give us a condition that will help us to find the location of the particle at time t equals 1. Okay, so here's what we would have done in section 5.1, and then we'll work, uh, here's 5.1, and then we'll work some FTC work, and you'll see why FTC is so much more powerful. Okay, so the integral of v of t, dt, should give us x of t, right, our position function. So let's take the integral of 3t squared plus 6t dt, and that is going to be, and we'll see, that'll end up being x of t. So the integral of 3t squared plus 6t is t cubed plus 3t squared plus our constant of integration, c, right? So if we plug that in here as our general position function, but we have this condition of 0, 2, right? If I plug a 0 in for t everywhere, I get 0 cubed plus 3 times 0 squared plus c. So clearly, c has to equal 2. Thus, our position function is t cubed plus 3t squared plus 2. So I could find x of 1 utilizing this new position function. It would be 1 cubed, which is 1, plus 3 times 1 squared, which is 3, plus 2, which is 6. Okay, so I would know my answer, right? And that's using our 5.1 methods. But using the fundamental theorem, what I can do is I know that the integral from 1 to 3, excuse me, 0 to 1, excuse me, 0 to 1, right? Because I'm going from time t equals 0 to time t equals 1 of v of t, t should equal x of 1 minus x of 0. Well, I already know x of 0. x of 0 is 2. I want to find x of 1. So let's set up what we could consider almost a linear equation, right? So the integral from 0 to 1 of v of t, what would that be? That would be, using the fundamental theorem, would be t cubed plus 3t squared uh, evaluated from 0 to 1. Okay, so if I evaluate at 1, that'd be 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared minus that evaluated at 0, which clearly would be 0. That's going to be equivalent to x of 1 minus x, or minus 2, which is x of 0. Okay, so let's solve for x of, x of 1. All right, so the left side here would equal 4, thus x of 1 minus 2 would equal 4. Okay, so clearly I can add 2, and x of 1 comes out to equal 6. All right, guys, that's two different ways to get to the same answer. FTC is clearly quicker in many cases just because of the, and once you, I mean, I guess it's not clear, but FTC will be much more efficient and quicker along the way. So hope that makes sense. Uh, that is whatever lesson this is. I can't remember now. Uh, I'll see you in the next video. Have a great day.